the, the plan of the lectures is that I'm going to start with uh, discussing the main objects, Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms and rep flows and main conjecture and periodic orbits. Um, a few years back, I gave a talk. It was in Haifa. And uh, after the talk, the, I was speaking about periodic orbits of Hamiltonian systems. And after the talk, a friend of mine came to me and said, you know, thank you. It was an absolutely beautiful talk. But it would be very useful if, in the beginning of the talk, you define periodic orbits. So uh, right now, whenever I speak about periodic orbits of Hamiltonian systems, I start with the definition of periodic orbits. So I'm going to talk about periodic, I'm going to define periodic orbits and then state um, uh, the main conjectures about periodic orbits of Hamiltonian systems, like the conic conjecture and other conjectures. So that's our plan for today, which is probably more than uh, we can do in one lecture, even in one very long lecture. Then, uh, whether we like it or not, I'll have to do a minimalist introduction to Floer theory, at least to, uh, uh, to set uh, the notation and conventions. And probably, if, if nothing else, this is by far the most useful part of the lectures, because Floer theory is important regardless of anything. Then it's going to get more technical. I'm going to prove the Conley conjecture, at least outline the proof uh, of the Conley conjecture, and talk about some related results like generic existence and resonance relations, and then go beyond the Conley conjecture. And hopefully, if time permits, I'm going to speak about uh, what happens with rep flows. Are there any questions? All right, then let's begin. Our main objects, well, for a while at least, the main object will be a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of a symplectic manifold. So, W to W omega will be a symplectic manifold, usually closed. And H is a Hamiltonian on W. It's convenient to think of it as one periodic in time. It's not really essential, but we will always assume and need it that it is one periodic in time. Um, then it gives rise to a, the um, Hamiltonian flow. So generated by the Hamiltonian vector field of H. This is not really a flow because the vector field is time dependent because the Hamiltonian is time dependent. It's actually simply an isotopy, Hamiltonian isotopy between the time one map and the identity. The time one map is a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. More specifically, this is the Hamiltonian diffeomorphism generated by the Hamiltonian A. It's not immediately obvious, but uh, it's an elementary fact that Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms form a group. Periodic orbits. Let's take a point P, see where it goes under the flow. It goes to some point phi of p. Then let's do it again. It goes to the point phi squared of p. And if eventually it comes back, 
after k iterations. We say that p phi of p phi squared of p up to the k minus first image write it here, is a k-periodic orbit. It's convenient sort of to uh, think of it in two ways. It can be sort of whenever we do Hamiltonian dynamics, there are always two perspectives. Uh, slightly different. We can think of it as a uh, as sort of discrete dynamics where time runs through one, two, three, etc., through positive integers. Or we can think of it as a continuous dynamics accounting for what's going on in between. The two uh, points of view are uh, essentially equivalent. So for instance, um, well, but uh, sort of they nicely complement each other. For instance, when we think about the continuous model, the uh, homotopy type of a periodic orbit uh, is readily visible there. Um, but in fact, it's not hard to see from the Arnold conjecture that uh, it's independent of how I go to, uh, from, the, uh, from the identity to phi, that it's actually determined by the time one map. Um, so in any event, here we have a key periodic orbits, and these points uh, p phi of p phi squared of p are key periodic points. So every or every k periodic orbit comprises several um, k periodic uh, points. Let's denote the collection of key periodic orbits by uh, p sub k of phi. This come in two types. Uh, they can be simple, they can be iterated. So to see the difference, we, uh, we can uh, uh, to see the difference, let's observe that if I have a fixed point, then, it, so that's a point that comes back to the initial position after, the, after we run the flow for time one. This is also a key periodic thing, because if I iterate this picture, it, uh, it's going to repeat it. Likewise, if I have a two-periodic orbit, um, it's also four-periodic, six-periodic, etc. So these are iterated orbits. Simple orbits, on the other hand, are the orbits where all these points are distinct. And I'm going to denote the collection of simple periodic uh, orbits of period k by, uh, by p, then little circle here. And finally here I can write this is the same as the collection of the fixed point of phi to the k divided by So, Floer theory readily implies that the collection of one periodic orbit, which is the same as the fixed point of phi, is non-empty. 
Unfortunately, because it's so robust, uh, floor theory does not tell us anything new about the iterations of uh, phi. Floor theory for the case iteration of phi is pretty much the same as the floor theory, or at least floor homology uh, as for phi. So this is kind of the blessing and the curse of floor homology. And the main questions we are going to discuss here today, questions along the lines, does the collection of K periodic orbit go to infinity as K goes to infinity. If it does, then how fast? Or pretty much an equivalent question is the collection of simple periodic orbits non-empty for some sequence k for some sequence of iterations going to infinity. In other words, do we have new periodic orbits created all the time with the order of iterations? Or is it possible that we have just uh, one periodic orbit and then nothing new happens? In other Relevant notion is that is the notion of non-degeneracy. So let's take a fixed point of phi then the differential of phi at p is a map from the tangent space oops, to itself. This map is, of course, always non-degenerate. It's a linear isomorphism between because phi is a diffeomorphism. We say that P is non-degenerate if this map has no eigenvalues equal to one. Oops, sorry, there is no question mark. That's the definition. So that's the first definition. A periodic orbit is non-degenerate. If every point in that periodic orbit is non-degenerate as a fixed point of phi to the k. So each point here in this orbit is a fixed point of phi to the k, and the whole orbit is called non-degenerate if each of them is fixed. In fact, because phi moves them around, it's enough to require that one of them is fixed. I say that phi is non-degenerate 
if all fixed points of phi are non-degenerate. And finally, I say phi is strongly or totally non-degenerate if all periodic orbits are non-degenerate. Let's write P of phi for the collection of all periodic orbits. Something to keep here in mind is that a fixed periodic, a fixed point can be non-degenerate as a fixed point of phi, but degenerate as a fixed point of phi squared. If you and this would be the case if you have a, a root of unity in this case of degree two. So if negative one is an eigenvalue, likewise, if you have a root of unity of degree k as an eigenvalue here, then the k iteration becomes uh, degenerate. And so here is a little fact. Non-degeneracy strong or not is a C infinity generic condition. It's actually non-trivial to prove, but it's so very classical that nobody sort of bothers to. It's non-trivial to prove it even more non-trivial to write up. Uh, I don't know like any readable account of the proof, but it's so very classical and so very well known that nobody sort of bothers uh, even to write it up. And sort of people who do usually fail. Uh, in kind of most of the modern, uh, modern accounts sort of go to the non-trivial point and then quote something like totally unreadable. Um, so in any event, we are not going to talk about it. It's just sort of a peculiar fact. Um, another peculiar fact about non-degeneracy, it's a very classical notion in dynamics. It sort of predates uh, Fleur theory and Hamiltonian dynamics by uh, hundreds of years. Uh, so it's actually interesting that uh, this Exactly this notion is relevant in Fleur theory where it's essentially like an equivalent uh, of the uh, uh, of the Morse condition of non-degeneracy of the action function. All right, now the second type of Hamiltonian flows, I hope to get to um, at the end of this lecture is rep flows. So here is the situation is different. H is an autonomous Hamiltonian on uh, some symplectic uh, manifold W. W does not have to be closed, but and we are interested in the dynamics of the flow on an energy level H equal to a constant. So we are interested in periodic orbits on this level. Uh, now the period, so the energy is fixed here, but the period is not. And because the uh, <coughs> Hamiltonian is autonomous, it makes sense to talk about periodic orbits of an arbitrary real period. Positive. So uh, let's assume it's regular. Now, as it 
uh, stands, there is nothing much we can say about periodic orbits on M. So here is a fact. Uh, there need not be periodic orbits on M, even when M is a small perturbation, C0 small perturbation of a sphere in R to N. But the question becomes meaningful if we require con, if we require M to have contact type. In other words, omega is d alpha on M, where alpha is a contact form. In this case, we have the rep vector field, which is determined by the condition that alpha of the rep is equal to 1 and the contraction of d alpha and rep is 0. And this rep vector field is proportional to the Hamiltonian vector field on M. A couple of examples, M in R to N, convex or more generally the boundary of a star-shaped domain then it has contact type and even more generally, when M is on any symplectic manifold, when M is trans, uh, transverse to a Liouville vector field, it will necessarily have contact type with alpha being the contraction of z and omega. So in particular, with this example in mind, I can take m in, in the cotangent bundle to something, and again require it fiber-wise convex or star -shaped. Now let's uh, kind of see it once and uh, for all that the Weinstein conjecture asserts that whenever you have a contact manifold, a manifold M or dimensional with a contact form, then the rep vector field necessarily has a closed orbit, periodic orbit. And this is not what we are interested in. This is actually an important result. It's known for some manifolds and not known for many manifolds. And the situation we are concerned with here is more like when the Weinstein conjecture is very well known and understood, and we are interested in the number of periodic orbits or uh, in how the period grows 
with um, so how the number grows with the period. The notion of non-degeneracy extends to the setting pretty much word for word, except, uh, well, no. L let's be careful here for a sec, because whenever we have an autonomous Hamiltonian and a non-trivial periodic orbit, there is always an eigenvector with eigenvalue equal to 1. This would be the vector tangent to the orbit. So non-degeneracy is always understood as non-degeneracy in the normal direction to an orbit in M. In the normal to the orbit X in M. And then it becomes a generic condition. Examples. So um, which part shall I erase? Uh, let's erase the non-degeneracy part, because I think we are pretty much done with it. Are there any questions? It's a good time for questions. This fact, uh, sort of in the um, in the very original version, it's uh, Michel Herman and myself. Then, um, uh, sort of in dimensions greater than or equal to six, then uh, Bashak and myself in dimension four in finite smoothness. Then the proofs were simplified again in higher dimensions, uh, first by um, Eli Kerman, and now a very simple proof is available recently. Uh, Geiges, Zemich, and someone else, I've seen a very simple proof. So it's, uh, it's a very simple fact, uh, fact nowadays, although the first construction, the first constructions were rather involved. All right, examples, some examples. Let's take a closed surface. Let's take an area preserving map and then it is of course symplectic pretty much by definition but it's not necessarily Hamiltonian it will be Hamiltonian if and only if it has zero flux. And this equivalence is a general fact not related to dimension two. And um, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to uh, tell you what the flux is in a sec. Uh, this is actually, in some sense, a much more uh, classical point of view on Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms than uh, the definition we gave here. This point of view goes back uh, probably uh, 30 years. And this is how people uh, were thinking about it. So let's. Um, 
flux is equal to zero. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, 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 let me define the uh, flux first. So let's let's observe that the way I define the Hamiltonian diffeomorphism uh, as something arising from a Hamiltonian flow gives rise to not just to an not just to an element uh, in the diffeomorphism group or the, the group of Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, but actually to an element in its universal covering. Because what I have here is an isotopy from the identity to phi sub h, and this determines a um, uh, um, an element in the universal covering. And in fact, with this definition, I can replace everywhere um, phi by the correspondent element in the, in the universal covering. So let's first, defining the flux, let's take an element in the universal covering of the in a, in a, of hand. Let's do this. Let's take a loop gamma and move it by the flow. It will trace, so this is the, uh, the cylinder phi t sub h of gamma, where t ra uh, runs from 0 to 1. Let's denote this cylinder by pi. Then the integral of omega all over pi is independent of this Hamiltonian isotopy as long as I stay within the same element of the universal covering. So I have a map which sends gamma to that integral. And in fact, the in, uh, the integral depends only on the homology class of gamma. So now I have a well-defined element in the second cohomology group, uh, sorry, in the first cohomology group of W. Alternatively, I can define it as this. Let's look at the contraction Sorry, I'm totally messing it up. So uh, every, everything I said is correct, except this integral is 0. Let's do this. Let's take an isotopy in the group of symplectomorphisms. Let's take an isotope in the group of symplectomorphisms. And apply this construction to this isotope. I'm thinking of the isotope as an element of the universal covering of the uh, connected component of the identity. Then I'm getting this integral. And alternatively, I can define the resulting cohomology class as, let's do this. Let's take 
the vector field generating the isotopy contracted with omega. Get some time dependent closed one form. And the fact that the, the one form is closed is exactly equivalent to the fact that this is a symplectomorphism. And then integrate it with respect to time from 0 to 1. Then what we get here, we get a, sort of an average cohomology uh, generating cohomology class. And this cohomology class is equal to the flux. Now, as such, I have flux defined as a map from the universal covering of the group of symplectomorphisms to R. And the universal covering of the Hamiltonian diffeomorphism is exactly the kernel of this map. Now, this is an old theorem that goes back probably to the uh, late 70s or early 80s. Probably the um, history of flux seriously begins with Banyaga and uh, ends with the uh, so-called flux conjecture proved by Ona later. Now to uh, go to uh, from the universal covering to the maps themselves, I have to account for the ambiguity in the choice of isotopy. So if I have to take flux on the group of symplectomorphism, I have to divide by that ambiguity. And this is, as a result, I'm taking the quotient of R by whatever can happen if I replace an isotopy by something different. I'm yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So here, thank you. Uh -huh. Here I'm dividing by the flux of pi one of sigma. The flux conjecture proved by on asserts that this is actually a discrete subgroup in H one. So what I have here is a fairly reasonable space, a product of a torus and some R. And now the same result that ham is equal to the kernel of the flux stands. So to understand whether something is Hamiltonian or not, I just have to see whether the flux is zero or not. And the simplest sort of use of the, this observation is let's take a torus with coordinates uh, theta 1 and theta 2. Let's take a rotation in one of the coordinates theta 1 plus, I don't know, A theta 2. So this is the flow which moves, which rotates just one of the generators. Let's take a look. I want to take the loop here tra uh, transverse to the flow and see what happens in, uh, in time one. So in time one, I move the loop by A. And therefore, the so this is my gamma. And therefore, if A is not an integer, I get some non-zero area here. The ambiguity is... Well, uh, and therefore, I get some area. Here, area is always non-zero. The ambiguity is flux um, of pi 1. I actually don't know what this is, but I know that 
this is an area of some torus in this torus. And so if under my if 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 say the integral of omega is equal to one, so what I have here is uh, is z. So as long as a is not an integer, this, the, this map is non-zero, the flux is non-zero, and therefore the map is, this translation map is area preserving but not Hamiltonian. Of course, it's immediate that the flow itself is not Hamiltonian. But if I'm interested in the time one map, this is probably the only way to show it. I, I would not know a simpler uh, way to show that this map is not Hamilton. People in low dimensional dynamics still think about Hamiltonian diffeomorphism in terms of flux. So here is another example. That was the first example. The second example, let's take h from r to n to r or the from the cotangent bundle to r. And let's make it convex. In the second case, it has to be fiberwise convex. Then any positive energy level has contact type. And we are in the setting of rep dynamics. This is, however, is a very classical subject. For instance, when in the second example, each comes from a Riemannian metric. then the rep flow is just the natural lift of the geodesic flow. And the question about existence of closed rep orbits is equivalent to the classical question of existence of closed geodesics. In this connection, uh, OK, I'll. I'll so in this closed rep orbit, I'm saying equal to, even though they are not exactly equal to, to be quite precise, if we have a closed geodesic, then the corresponding closed rep orbit is something like gamma gamma dot. So a conjecture, which is thinking about this class of questions, it's useful to keep this conjecture in mind as some sort of beacon to see, uh, to, to gauge how close or how far we are uh, from it. So the conjecture is every geodesic flu has well, every Riemannian manifold has infinitely many closed geodesics. So this is known and 
fairly easy by modern stand standards for some manifolds, depending on the algebraic topology, and not known for some very simple manifolds. So known, let me maybe spell out, because it's important to keep it background. No. Uh, well, it's known when the homology of the loop space grows. You get larger and larger homology, and you need more and more periodic orbits, more and more rep orbits to generate this homology. If I have time, I'm going to speak about this a little bit late, maybe in the last uh, lecture. So this is the case for this is the case when B itself has sufficiently complicated topology. For instance, when uh, I think it's actually if and only if, then the homology of cohomology of B requires at least two generators as an algebra. So this is not true for the spheres. A sphere, of course, is generated, has very simple uh, homology generated by one element. So, so not true, I, uh, I mean the growth fact. And the conjecture is open, so let's, let's be more specific, no growth. The conjecture nonetheless, and here things get non-trivial, is known for S2, and I'm going to talk about the proof, and completely open for spheres of high dimension, very much so. So kind of whenever you prove a result and think this result gets uh, too close to proving this conjecture, then probably there is an error somewhere. This is kind of a uh, rule I, I use for myself. And whenever kind of. Um, Stating something, we will sort of try to understand how it is related to the conjecture. So um, another class of very classical flows that fits into this framework is the uh, Kinsler geodesic flow. So rather than taking a uh, quadratic form, I just uh, uh, I can just take something fiberwise convex, and then if it encloses uh, the zero section in Riemannian uh, geometry, we would call it a Finsler metric. And something again to keep in mind is that the conjecture is specifically Riemannian. It, it's manifestly not true for Finsner metric. So fact as n admits a Finsler metric with finitely many geodesics. In fact, the number of geodesics is n or n plus 
1 or n minus 1, depending on the parity of n. These are the so-called Catoch Ziller examples. Which, by the way, tells us that if I wanted to prove the conjecture by something like Fleur theoretical methods, then at least naively, it would not buy me anything. Moreover, it would be in some sense misleading because once I change the Hamiltonian a little bit, just a little bit, um, uh, the, the conjecture fails. One fine remark is that this Finsler metric is asymmetric. So One can try to make use of that symmetry. And maybe the Then, 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 then everything becomes very robust indeed, and uh, uh, the um, and you have infinitely many geodesics for Finsler metrics, and actually for anything fiberwise convex, and yeah, and uh, actually for anything fiberwise convex, and I think um, in the fiberwise convex case, um, this is a result of. Maclean on one side and, 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 uh, and Macarini and Hrinevitz on the other side. There is a little nuance here because actually um, this holds regardless of non-degeneracy. And again, I'll talk about uh, some real, uh, relative facts later. You see, when your um, Hamiltonian is Degenerate, it's not immediate when your Riemannian, your geodesics are degenerate, it's not Im immediately clear why this condition implies the existence of infinitely many geodesics. Because hypothetically, you could pack, pack a lot of homology into one, uh, one geodesic. So, so there is something to prove. There is a little, a little bit to prove. So, and, and the last example, which may or may not factor into, into this talk, into, into this lecture later, uh, magnetic flows. Let's take the cotangent bundle of some manifold, and rather than looking at the geodesic flow, this is the flow of the Hamiltonian of the, of the kinetic energies. I'm going to take the same Hamiltonian, but now change the symplectic form slightly. Namely, the way I change it is I'm going to take a closed form on the base. Pull it back to the cotangent bundle and add it to the standard DPDQ symplectic form on the cotangent bundle. Regardless of what I put here, the resulting form is symplectic. It's obviously closed, and when you write it uh, in the appropriate basis, it is kind of block up a triangular. So this thing does not really uh, contribute anything to non-degeneracy. So this is symplectic. Now, when I take the Hamiltonian H of this form, 
it gives rise again because this is a symplectic form today. Uh, it give, uh, gives rise to uh, a flow. Now the Hamiltonian is homogeneous of degree two, but the symplectic form is not homogeneous at all. So now the flow in contrast with the Riemannian case, or in, in contrast with the case sigma equal to zero, the flow depends on the level. Moreover, the level does not have, uh, in general, does not have contact type when sigma is not exact. Nonetheless, these flows are of considerable in, uh, interest in applications because um, the Hamiltonian flow of H describes the motion of a unit charge on B with sigma being the magnetic field. So, uh, and the existence of periodic orbits in this um, setting uh, has been studied by, so at least this, uh, the beginning of the story is works of uh, Arnold and Novik. And time-wise, it, it might have been even one of the reasons for Novikov sort of to, uh, at least one of the reasons to invent Morse Novikov homology because uh, certainly the Morse Novikov homology arises in this situation. Now, as, as, I, as, I, as I prepared this lectures, I observed that these examples are heavily biased towards uh, rep flows, towards autonomous flows. In fact, only one of the examples uh, has to do with actually discrete dynamics with uh, Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. And indeed, sort of, if we want to, uh, okay, let's put it this way. I don't know so many natural examples of, Hamilton, uh, of time dependent Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. Actually, this object, they do arise in, uh, in applications, but not as much as red flows. All right, are there any questions? Questions? All right, now then I, we can state, start stating the main results and conjectures. I'm going to focus exclusively on the Hamiltonian case, leaving the rep case for later. I'll probably never get to it, but uh, I'll save some time at least to briefly mention it. So main results and conjecture. W is closed now. In a nutshell, the main thesis of this lecture is that Hamiltonian systems, and by that I mean uh, either sort of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms or rep flows, tend to have infinitely many periodic orbits, almost always. No, with some very rare exceptions. So here comes the Conley conjecture, as I pre prefer to think about it. For many 
W. Every Hamiltonian diffeomorphism has infinitely many periodic orbits. So the emphasis here is on every. This is kind of an unconditional statement. And of course, it's totally meaningless as long as I don't specify what many means. Let me tell you what is known. Actually, maybe I can skip it. So. Theorem. Let's assume one of the following conditions. One condition is the Colabi Yam. That the first churn class of W vanishes on pi two of W. The second one is negative monotone. Namely, omega on pi 2 is proportional to C1 of W on pi 2. And the coefficient is negative. Then, under either one of these conditions, Every phi with finitely many fixed points has simple periodic orbits. of arbitrarily large period. In other words, there exists a sequence of iterations going to infinity such that there are simple periodic orbits for this iteration. I'm going to attribute this theorem and uh, discuss its history a little bit later. Let's note that, as stated, it sort of implies the Corny conjecture for these two classes of manifolds because if this condition is not satisfied, if you have infinitely many fixed points, then you already have infinitely many periodic orbits on, on the nodes. Um, okay. Corollary. One way, as I said, one, one way or another we have infinitely many periodic orbits, and one can also be more precise here. 
when you do dynamics, you also interested in actually uh, how many simple periodic orbits you get as the order of iterations uh, uh, goes to infinity. So the, at, at least in the Calabi Yau case, you have the growth, maybe I would write it, the number of simple periodic orbits with period less than or equal to k grows at least as k divided by log k, perhaps minus a constant. So it's almost, uh, grows almost linearly. This type of lower bound on the growth is quite typical in Hamiltonian dynamics. There are uh, a few cases, there are some cases where you can improve it, but overall you almost invariably get with something like that. And in fact, it usually comes from the fact that you just get all, uh, all sufficiently large primes as uh, simple periods. Now, how common or uncommon are many faults meeting these requirements? Oops. Here is something non-trivial about the symplectic Calabi-Yau manifolds. Something. So the manifolds this theorem applies to. Um, well, starting with uh, symplectic Calabi-Yau uh, manifolds, well, of course, we know the tori, uh, because, uh, of course, we know the surfaces. Of genus at least one. Of course, we can take the uh, products we have K3 surfaces, we have algebraic Calabi-Yau manifolds, uh, and we can take products, and, and, and that's about all. So here is a non-trivial fact. I did not know till relatively recently, this is fine and Panov. Um, for any finitely generated group, there exists a symplectic Calabi Yau W of dimension at least six, well, of dimension six, one can say, with um, pi 1 equal to this group. So in fact, there are a lot of them. There is just like sort of totally intractable uh, collection of, uh, of manifolds. As for negative monotone manifolds. Well, uh, here is a, a good way to think about them. Let's take W in CPN plus M given as a complete intersection of M hypersurfaces of degrees D1 through Dm. then W is negative monotone. If the total degree is sufficiently high. Okay. 
Calabi-Yau, if it is exactly equal to n plus n plus 1, and monotone, or positively monotone, meaning this constant is positive, when the degree is low. So but in other words, when I look at complete intersections and take the degree as a kind of measure of complexity, then the absolute majority of them will be negative monotone. And we tend to think about them as kind of the uh, generic type. Now, what is not known? Let me make two conjectures here. So the Conley conjecture, now I'm trying to go beyond these two classes. The Conley conjecture holds when the minimal churn is sufficiently large. I don't know what sufficiently large is, n plus 1 or maybe 2n, nothing known, actually. Once, if you think about the kalabi yau so the kalabi yau case corresponds to the minimal churn equal to infinity. So once I go from infinity just one step down and replace it by something enormously large as a function of the dimension, uh, I don't know what's going on. This is, this conjecture is due to Gurel. And the second conjecture, which is equally intractable at the moment, is uh, that the Conley conjecture fails. So if the Conley conjecture fails, then there are some holomorphic spheres. Gromovitan invariants are non-zero. This is uh, chance and Magda. And again, nothing known here. But this, probably if you could, uh, and so both of these questions, this would be pretty much the end of this story. Now, a very brief history of the theorem or of the of the Conley conjecture. Well, first of all, it's indeed conjecture, uh, conjectured by Charles Conley. In 1984, for the torus. Then the first serious result, uh, result is for symplectic Calabi Yao. Actually, they assumed a little bit more. They assumed uh, a little bit more, but uh, in, in fact, from the modern perspective, it is symplectic um, Calabi Yau plus what's called weak non-degeneracy. And I'm going to spell it out. And this is Salomon and Zender. Weak non-degeneracy. Well, remember, non-degeneracy means that 
none of the eigenvalues is equal to 1. Weak non-degeneracy means that for every fixed point, there is an eigenvalue not equal to 1. So a fixed point is non-degenerate is if all eigenvalues are not equal to 1, and weakly non-degenerate if it has one eigenvalue not equal. So if it's not totally degenerate. Then there was a, so, and, and this is around 1992, give or take. Then there was a huge um, period when there was not much happening, at least in this, in this direction. So the next step was for surfaces of genus greater than or equal to one. And this is Frank's and Handel around 2003. By totally different methods going to uh, from low dimensional dynamics. Then the original conjecture for the torus was proved by Hingston around 2000, I don't know, seven, eight. Then a couple of years later, things are sort of, whenever I give these dates, I don't know whether sort of one uh, sh sh should put the, the publication date or the uh, preprint date. So it, it, let's put it seven. Uh, let's put seven here. And um, uh, for W, simplistically, is spherical. I proved it um, around maybe 2009, a couple of years later after Nancy Hingston. Then um, for W, um, Calabial plus rational. And that means that the, the cohomology class of the synthetic form is uh, rational or integer. This would be uh, Basha Gorel and myself. Maybe a little bit later. Then Doris Hein removed the rationality condition. So that's how it's stated here without rationality. And then the negative monotone case is chance, Michael chance, the same chance as in that conjecture, and Bashak and me. And then in a slightly stronger form. So that's more recently. So that's a very brief history. So a couple of related results here. A lot of activity was, a lot of activity happened here. And this, this yellow part has to do with a totally different machinery. It's 
spectral invariance and symplectic capacities. And concerns the case when you have a Hamiltonian or Hamiltonian diffeomorphism with a relatively small support, with a displaceable support. For instance, a compactly supported Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of R2. Then, of course, it has tons of uh, fixed points, namely the fixed points outside the support. And one has to modify the conjecture a little bit, uh, a little bit to make it meaningful. The first thing you want to see, it has, has non-trivial uh, periodic orbit, but if it is, Time dependent, how do, uh, how do you tell trivial from non-trivial? And uh, the usual way to do it is to require the action to be non-zero. And then actually in this case, it's pretty standard nowadays fact that um, um, the conic conjecture holds in this case. It's an easy consequence of uh, symplectic capacities of spectral invariance. So this is one activity. Uh, that was happening particularly like during this period, and I'm not going to talk about it. Here, the story uh, starts with Viterbo and Hofer and Zender. Then I think Fraunfelder and Schlenk, Gurel, uh, many people. So it's sort of been a fairly active Area. This is one thing I'm not going to talk about. And the second thing I'm not going to talk about is a fairly meaningful variant of the question. Um, we consider here when W is open. For instance, we can take W, the cotangent bundle. We can take the Hamiltonian to be something like the uh, kinetic energy plus potential energy and look at the time one map or, or something more, more general but with quadratic growth at infinity and ask the same question. And again, in this case, there is a variant of uh, the Kone conjecture. So I think the uh, first case for W uh, being the torus is proved by Long, then Mazzucchelli, then Hein. And this is something I am not going to talk about, maybe just briefly mention, but I want to emphasize that this version of the Kuhn conjecture does not have anything to do with the existence of infinitely many geodesics. It's kind of tempting to th uh, think that the two, the two questions are related. In fact, they are not. Because whenever I set uh, the potential energy equal to zero, I have the pure Riemannian metric. I apply the Conley conjecture. I find my infinitely many periodic orbits. I find my infinitely many geodesics. But I know there are infinitely many geodesics anyway. There are constant geodesics. And this is actually the geodesic I find. So it, the, in the Riemannian case, it just detects the uh, constant periodic orbits. So it's kind of, it, answer, uh, it, it, it answers a different question in this setting. Um, now one more thing to uh, keep in mind is that why do we care about periodic orbits altogether? Uh, actually, I don't have a good question to this, uh, a good answer to this question because obviously periodic orbits capture very little, very small part of dynamics. 
But on the other hand, it is an important part of dynamics. It is kind of the simplest possible part of dynamics, and often uh, it is the key to understanding more of dynamics, particularly if you, in addition to uh, finding periodic orbits, you can say a little bit about the type, say if they elliptic or hyperbolic or something. Unfortunately, very little known about this. I still have five minutes to go, and I'm going to use these five minutes to talk about the contraexamples, quote unquote, or start talking about the contraexamples to the conic conjecture. In contrast with the Arnold conjecture, the conic conjecture does not hold unconditionally. There are many there are some manifolds for which it fails. And I'm going to describe these contraexamples in the sort of uh, order of increasing generality. The first one is an irrational rotation of S2. Let's just take S2. Let's take the rotation of S2 in an irrational angle. This is a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism given by the height function. And so on. Uh, and on every parallel, I have an irrational rotation. And an irrational rotation has no periodic points whatsoever. And so the only fixed point, the only periodic points are the fixed points. And these are the poles. As I said, I'm going to uh, do it in the order of increasing generality. Let's take CPN. And let's take the Hamiltonian. Well, let's take a quadratic Hamiltonian. So in homogeneous coordinates, I want to write something like that. And to have it well defined, let's divide it by the sum of the squares. And I want the eigenvalues lambda g to be rationally independent. And by that, I mean uh, simply linearly independent over q. Uh, one can do better than that. But then, again, we have the periodic orbits equal to fixed points. And these are just the coordinate x. Next step, let W admit a Hamiltonian torus action. And I want the fixed point set of that action to be finite. Then a generic element of the torus, then for a generic element of the torus, the fixed point and actually the periodic the set of periodic orbits of that element is equal to the set of fixed points. So the same is true. For instance, well, CPN admits a, a 
it's, it's, a, it's a toric uh, um, manifold, so I, I have a torus action. So in this class, we get a lot of stuff. We get, uh, in addition to CPN, we get Grassmannians, we get toric manifolds, we get a huge majority of the co-adjoint orbits of compact Lie groups. And now I have exactly one minute to finish with the question. Going back to this example, well, this example is very boring. Actually, from the dynamics perspective, all these examples are very boring. But uh, uh, this one is the most boring of all. So there is a fact is that there exists A Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of S2 with exactly three ergodic meshes. Without defining what uh, an ergodic measure is, um, one can think this way, that sort of a, when you look at the support of the measure, or when you think in, uh, with respect to that measure, you want your phi to be very mixing with respect to that measure. And these three ergodic measures are, well, first of all, there are, two, there are necessarily two fixed points. And then I know there is, well, this uh, a fixed point is an invariant uh, measure, and certainly everything is very mixing with respect to that fixed point. And then I know one more. There is the, uh, the symplectic form itself. So in other words, it looks pretty much like this irrational rotation, except in between the poles, it's very, very mixing. In particular, it does not have any other periodic orbit because if it did, I would have a measure associated with that periodic orbit. So examples like that were first constructed by Anosov and Katok. and they're known as pseudo-rotations. They are known to exist in high dimensions too, but only as volume preserving. So here is an open problem. Construct a Hamiltonian pseudo-rotation in dimension strictly greater than 2. For instance, for CP2. So construct a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of CP2 with a finite number of ergodic invariant measures, something like, in, the, in particular, it would necessarily have only finitely many periodic orbits. This is absolutely unknown. It appears to be a tractable problem, but uh, actually fairly, fairly difficult. So um, I'll start the next, next lecture by discussing actually what to do when the quantum conjecture fails. After all, the kind of, as, as it is clear by now, we understand the conjecture reasonably well at this stage. Thank you.